Hi everyone. Here we are. Uh, we're going to continue our lecture on uh, skeletal muscle. Um, yes, I, I needed a quiet, cool place to work, so I'm down here in the wine cellar. Um, they're all closed, I, I swear. Uh, <laughs> I haven't popped one open. Um, anyway, so yes, we're going to continue our talk about skeletal muscle. And um, in this lecture, we'll be talking about um, the whole skeletal muscle, how we can uh, control the whole skeletal muscle. And what we're going to see is that it's the properties of the individual skeletal muscles that help us control a contraction of an entire skeletal muscle. Okay, so here we go. So if you recall from uh, the last lecture on skeletal muscle, uh, we did look at individual muscle fibers or muscle cells, and we looked at how they contracted inside of each of those muscle cells. And then we also looked at the stimulation at the neuromuscular junction as well. So here I wanted to remind you what a uh, muscle fiber looks like and, and also recall we looked at how those individual muscle fibers are grouped up to make a whole muscle. So it's important to remember that individual muscle fibers group up to form fascicles and fascicles group up to form the entire muscle. And then along each uh, uh, section of the muscle, so there are connective tissues wrapped around them. So the um, skeletal muscle cell or fiber is wrapped by endomycium, the fascicles are wrapped by paramycium, and the entire muscle is wrapped by epimycium. Now those connective tissues travel the length of the entire muscle, so whether it's over the cell, the fascicle, or the entire muscle, that connective tissue is uh, over the length of the entire structures of those three structures and they come together at the end forming the tendon. So you can see that there in this picture with the tendon um, uh, attached to the bone right there. So a thing to remember is that when muscles contract, okay, when muscles contract, that contraction is initiated within the cell right, the, um, the sliding filament theory that you're learning about. And that takes ATP in order for the contraction to occur, right? So when it contracts and it generates tension, it's generating a force, okay? And we call that force that's generated by the actual contraction of each of the cells, of each of the sarcomeres, that we refer to that as active force, right? Because it's using ATP. That's where the force is actually developing, okay? That force gets transmitted all along the length of the cell because every single uh, sarcomere within a cell is contracting. And so when the cell contracts and it's got all of these tissues wrapped around them, the cell is attached to those tissues and it ends up pulling on the tissues as well, okay? So that ends up creating a tension within the tissues so that the tissues on the end forming the, the tendon then can, um, can produce a force in order to move that bone. And that bone might be weighted by an object, right? Something you're holding, okay? This is a weighted object. It's iced tea, I swear, <laughs> okay? And so this is weighted by an object, so that force being generated by the muscle cells being transferred to the tendons has to overcome the weight of the object so that I can hold it up. Okay, so the act of force first is being transferred to the tendons, right? And that force then being generated in the tendons because the tissues are pulling, okay? That's called passive force. So those, those are connective tissues. Those tissues are not actively pulling, they're just receiving the force created by the cells. So the active force is being transferred to the tendon which develops um, passive force. Okay, so if you can imagine a rope that's slack, right, when you apply force to it, when you move it, that rope then develops tension and it gets tight and if something's connected to the end of it, you pull it. Okay, so that's the difference between active force and passive force. So that's an important part to know. So it says there on the slide 
the muscle tension is transmitted to the bone via the series, as, as series elastic component. And again, what that means is all of those connective tissues that are connected to those cells, all of those connective tissues in series, forming the tendon until it finally attaches to the bone. Okay, and again, that's what's just developing tension because we're tightening it up, we're pulling on it, and we're tightening it up, and that's a passive force. Now it has more force. Okay, it's like a, um, it's like the a potential energy. The cell is creating the kinetic energy, and then by pulling on the tendon, that's creating a potential energy. But then if it overcomes the weight of the object, then you're able to move it, and you have kinetic energy again. Okay, all right, so um, another thing to remember is that whole muscles uh, contractions can be a varying strength. Okay, so remember, it's the individual muscle cells that are contracting. Okay, and we call that a twitch. And this is what you can see on the line here. It's pointing out what a twitch looks like if we hook up a muscle to um, uh, a device that can measure the electricity of the muscle, like an EMG, right? What it'll show is a very brief, rapid contraction of the muscle fiber. That's a single twitch, and that's produced by a single action potential. Okay, so single twitches in one individual muscle fiber, that twitch is actually very short, and it's also very weak. So an individual one uh, isn't very useful in our muscles. So what we will see a little bit later is that we can contract several cells at the same time. And if we're able to contract several of those cells at the same time, then we're gonna get a stronger contraction, okay? And again, that first line there says, whole muscle contractions can be of varying strength. So now you can see if a single muscle cell is kind of weak, if you add a few muscle cells, that'll be a little stronger. If you add more than that, that'll be a little stronger still. If you've got them all contracting, then you've got a really strong contraction. That's how we vary the strength of a whole muscle. A whole muscle consists of, depending on the muscle we're talking about, hundreds to thousands of cells. And if we contract a small subset, then it's gonna be a weak contraction. If we stimulate to contract a larger subset, it's going to be a much stronger contraction and so on and so forth. So that's how we vary the strength. All right, so let's look at um, this figure, and I wanna remind you of this figure. I think we saw it before. Um, so this is the relationship of an action potential to the resultant muscle twitch. And maybe I'm thinking of lab. This is, if you're taking the lab, this is where you saw it before. Okay, so, so let's look at the first two graphs. The one on the top is showing us graphically what a twitch might look like. Now we've, we've extended it out. You can see the time at the bottom. You can see time in milliseconds, and that's at the end of the contraction is 100 milliseconds. So this is very fast, but if we can extend the graph out, then it makes it easier for us to see what happened. So first, just look at the line. The line is showing you it's at rest and at, at the, the horizontal blue line at the bottom. It means the cell is at rest. It's not contracting at all. But then as the blue line begins to rise, that means all of those sarco sarcomeres are contracting, right? They're getting smaller and all of them down the cell are contracting and that's producing a tension. That's the force it's be producing, right? So all of those cells, actin and myosin is pulling on actin and it's producing a tension. And there's a point when there's a, a peak tension that's produced. Okay, and then when all the myosin's heads release the actin, then the tension gets relieved. And so the blue line now is falling, so there's less tension over time. At the bottom shows the relationship. The only way we can get that muscle to contract is we need an action potential. So we saw in the last lecture that we have the neuromuscular junction. We have a motor neuron that uh, stimulates individual muscle cells by uh, using the neurotransmitter ACH, which will open sodium channels and you'll get depolarization along the cell membrane of a muscle cell. So that's what the bottom graph is showing you, that the action potential. It looks, we didn't add in there the, 
the hyperpolarization and all that stuff. Because right now, all we want you to see is that boom and action potential happened. Okay. And so um, the uh, duration of the action potential also is not drawn to scale, it's exaggerated. But again, you can see the timing difference that it takes, the action potential takes about one to two milliseconds, but then it takes um, a good, what, 50 milliseconds or more for the contraction to actually occur, okay? And so when the action potential fires, the red line, the red uh, blip that you see there, then it takes a moment for the contraction to actually work. They don't really overlap on one another. And again, that's just because the action potential, remember, is being transferred. It happens on the surface of the cell membrane. And so that electricity has to travel down the cell membrane to the T-tubule, to the SR, right? And then the SR has to stimulate the release of calcium. And so all of that takes a little bit of time. And that little bit of time is called the latent period. So the latent period is when the action potential fires and all those other sequence of events are occurring. And then actin and myosin will make contact and start to pull and shorten our sarcomeres. Okay. All right. So that's what it looks like graphically. Here's what it looks like when we control our muscle cells. So you saw a real close-up on the previous lecture. So this one shows... Uh, two neurons that are stimulating or, or have the ability to split, stimulate once they're firing, uh, several different uh, muscle fibers, okay? And so one of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one of them stimulates ten muscle cells. The other one is stimulating what we can see, eight muscle cells, okay? So what you're looking at is something called a motor unit, a motor unit is a single neuron plus all of the muscle cells that it stimulates to contract. So the first motor neuron toward the top, you can see starts in the uh, ventral horn of the gray matter of the spinal cord, right? And that one can stimulate up to 10 muscle cells in this graphical, this picture, okay? The other one next to it uh, that one can stimulate eight muscle cells. So those are, we're looking at two motor units right there. Two motor units. Okay, and let me show you the next frame. Shows you the same thing, but a little bit um, more detail so that you can see how each one, now, now we're looking at three motor units, and each one of the three motor units is stimulating a subset of cells. They're each stimulating different cells. So basically, now what you can see is that this is one factor that affects the strength of a muscle. This is how you can lift something very light or you can lift something very heavy because um, we can change the number of muscle cells that contract within a whole muscle. So if you're picking up something as light as a pencil, you probably only need to stimulate motor unit number one. Those three subset of cells is enough to pick up that pencil. Okay, um, maybe now you're picking up a book. And so now you only need to run motor unit one and two. That's enough to, of contracting cells to produce enough active force to transfer into the tendons to produce passive force to overcome the load that you're carrying, which is your book. Okay. If it's something very heavy, uh, extremely heavy for you, a, a very large bag of groceries full of gallons of milk and things like that. Well, then you may have to stimulate all three of those motor units. Okay, and again, this is just a stylized view, so <laughs> the number of motor units is going to be more within an actual muscle. But this is just to kind of get that um, arrangement across. Okay, so what this does is it helps you to vary the amount of strength that's needed. This is called recruitment, and it's your brain that figures this out. So your brain is estimating how heavy the object is, and then it's firing the correct amount of motor units the brain determines that it's needed. And so um, that's why when you come across something you don't know anything about, you might 
try to pick it up and then you realize, oh, that's a little heavier than I thought. So your brain is making those calculations in there and it's going to fire more motor units as needed. Okay, so that's recruitment. It's recruiting more motor units. Okay, have you ever done this? I've done this. You pick up a, uh, you see a gallon of milk on the counter and you have experience with gallons of milk, right? And so your brain estimates how heavy it is. And then you go to grab it, and when you pick it up, woo, it's really light, it was empty, and you didn't know it was empty, and you kind of, whoa, you throw it up in the air. Your brain was estimating how many motor units are needed for a full gallon of milk, oh, right? But you realize then too late that it's actually empty. So you had too many motor units firing. So that, that's a way to kind of understand um, how these motor units work. Okay. And they can help prevent fatigue because we don't necessarily have to fire every motor unit at the same time. Okay, So this what's called asynchronous firing of motor units can really help prevent fatigue. So let me show you this one. So fatigue, again, fatigue just means in our muscles the inability to maintain muscle tension. Right? So you're contracting your muscles and then there's a point you feel weak. What's happening is you're not able to maintain the tension in there. Okay, something's going on within the cells that the cross bridges aren't able to continue and the power strokes. And we'll talk a little bit later about um, why that might happen with fatigue. But for now, I wanna show you how motor units help us to prevent fatigue. And they help us to continue with a smooth, sustained contraction. And so um, this graph uh, kind of I've got both pictures here. So on the right side, you see three motor units. On the left side, it just shows graphically what happens. When you first pick something up, motor unit one will start to fire, okay? And, um, and you've estimated, maybe it's a light weight, a three pound weight, and you've estimated, your brain estimated that we only need motor unit one to be able to fire, okay? But you're holding it for a little while now and those cells are beginning to fatigue. So then it's gonna recruit maybe motor unit two on top of it, okay? And now you can see up the y-axis of that graph, the whole muscle tension, you've got more muscle tension if you follow the blue line across, okay? But now you're holding it even longer, and so the brain determines, okay, these are getting more tired, and so they'll recruit another motor unit, and that's the, the orangest one there. And so on the graph, you can see by recruiting the third motor unit, now you've got even more tension developed, okay? Because some of your cells are starting to fatigue. Your motor units can also rotate. So maybe first it fires motor unit one and two, and number three is out. And then number one is starting to get fatigued, so now it drops out number, motor unit number one, it's not firing anymore, and it, it recruits motor unit number three. So now you have two and three firing. And then um, motor unit, um, two begins to get tired, so it brings motor unit one back. So now you have one and three firing. Okay, so you can rotate them around. Alrighty, now we can't do this in maximal contractions because in a maximal contraction, it means just that. You are contracting all of your muscle cells, so there aren't any others to rotate with. So eventually fatigue will take place. Even when you are rotating, again, depending on the weight of the object, how long you're holding it, Fatigue may set in and because you, there, there's not enough cells to rotate around. There's, there's not enough time for some cells to recover from, okay? So really make sure you understand what a motor unit is, what's the definition of a motor unit, um, and how they control the individual muscle cells. What is motor unit re recruitment, okay? And how does motor unit recruitment help prevent fatigue? You should be able to explain that in words. All right. So um, there are other factors that affect the amount of strength a muscle, muscle can develop. Okay, and, and that other another factor is called the tension within the fiber. Okay, we saw the stimulation, and I talked about how that stimulation produces tension, but now we're gonna look at the actual uh, tension that gets produced within a fiber. And again, we'll talk about one fiber, but there's, there's gonna be several fibers doing this at the same time, okay? Um, so the tension within a fiber um, has to do with the frequency of stimulation, the length of the fiber, 
the thickness of the fiber, and then also the extent of the fatigue. Okay, so we're going to look at each one of these, and we're going to start with the frequency of stimulation. In real life, I look like her, right? But, you know, the video makes you look funny. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, okay, so the frequency of stimulation. So again, let's just review the slide again, okay? Because I just want you to understand, again, that relationship between the action potential and then the contraction that's produced. Okay, so the action potential comes in and it only lasts about one to two milliseconds. And then the contraction time lasts about 50 milliseconds. So again, we're layering tension into this. So when the cells begin to contract, when it's just a few myosin making cross bridges with the actin, you can see that there, it's a lower amount of tension. But as more myosin fibers make uh, uh, cross bridging with the actin, then our blue line starts to rise because more and more tension is being produced. Okay, um, And so again, that takes... I don't know, about 50 milliseconds or so. Takes about another 50 milliseconds or so then for the calcium to be pumped back into the SR. That's the relaxation cycle. So as calcium gets pumped back into the, real, into the SR, remember it's not binding to troponin then, and tropomyosin can lay over the active sites, and that prevents cross bridging. So the cell will begin to lengthen back to its original length and um, release the tension. It's not producing tension anymore. Okay, so uh, this, this important property is what allows us to produce muscle contractions at varying strength. Okay, so muscle contractions, again, can be graded. So let's see how that works. So more, more um, graphs for you to look at. So again, the very first panel there under A just shows what we've been looking at, but now you're seeing two contractions. So an action potential comes, the muscle above it, the blue line above, you can see is a single twitch. It, it creates tension and then relaxes. And um, by the time it relaxes, then another action potential comes in. So you get a same contraction and relaxation cycle, the same amount of tension and relaxation. Because the second uh, action potential came when the first twitch relaxed all the way. It, it rebounded all the way to its original length. Okay, in the second panel, now you can see the action potentials are coming quicker. So the first action potential comes and we get the contraction, tension is developing. But before that muscle cell can relax, before all the tension is released, another action potential comes. Okay, so the fiber is stimulated before it is allowed to completely relax. That second twitch then adds to the tension of the first twitch. So now we have twitch summation. It's very similar to what you saw with EPSPs in the first unit when we studied postsynaptic neuron. This now has to do with the contractions piggybacking on one another and adding to it. So you get a little bit stronger, um, stronger uh, co contraction, okay? It's probably what's happening is that if you stimulate the muscle after it has a chance to completely relax, like in the first panel, then the calcium is pretty much removed out of the cytoplasm and being taken up into the SR. So all of those um, cross bridges are released. In the second panel in B there, what's happening is that you get the first stimulation and it contracts, and I got a lot of cross bridging going on. And then it's just starting to release because some of the calcium is starting to be taken up into the SR. But before it's all taken up, it gets another contraction. So now you have even more calcium in the cytoplasm that can bind to more of the troponin. Okay, remember when we looked at troponin around the, the tropomyosin and then all the cross bridging, we saw lots of troponin. So if there's not a lot of calcium being released, only some of those troponin are being bound to so that only some of the active sites are exposed and only then uh, myosin can only make cross bridges with some of them. The more calcium that's left in the cytosol, then the more uh, will bind to troponin, more of the troponin will be bound to. And so the tropomyosin now is really moving in all those areas off of a lot more active sites. 
So you get a lot more binding, okay, of uh, myosin. So that's what's causing the summation, right? You're getting more uh, cross-bridging occurring. Okay, and now look at the third panel. If you've got so many action potentials coming in that you don't allow each contraction cycle to relax at all, there's no re relaxation between these stimuli, then you get a sustained contraction of this maximal strength. This is called tetanus. When your muscle is in tetanus, that means that it has a sustained contraction. Okay, you're not releasing it. And our skeletal muscles, that's very normal for our skeletal muscles. So if I ask you, you know, to show me your muscle, strike a pose, right? Look how big my muscle is. There it is. That's how big it is. When you do that, <laughs> right, I'm holding it, that's a sustained contraction. My muscle is in tetanus right now. Okay, and so that's what you do if you're holding something really heavy and you don't want to drop it. You're keeping your muscle in tetanus. You're holding a sustained contraction instead of contracting and release, contracting and release, okay? Um, but you can see fatigue is gonna set in. You see that at the very end of, of tetanus there, stimulation ceases or fatigue begins. So that then relates back to what we just learned about motor unit recruitment. In tetanus, most of the motor units are firing or they're recruiting, they're, they're circulating around. But again, there's going to be a point where cells are fatiguing and we can't recruit fresh cells anymore. And so the fatigue will set in and that'll start to release the tension and you'll lose your contraction. And hopefully you don't do that when you drop something. All righty, so that's tetanus. Okay, here's what it would look like in actuality if you hooked up your muscle again to an EMG um, to measure the electrical activity of your muscles themselves. So you can see a single twitch, but then the second one comes in before that one fully relaxed, and uh, the second twitch, that, or the second stimulus comes in before the first twitch fully relaxed. It's not showing you the stimulus on this graph, but it is showing you then the second uh, contraction has summated. Okay, so it's actually a stronger contraction. Okay, so that, that's another way that we can vary the strength. Okay, so let me go back up to this guy. So we just looked at how we vary the tension within a muscle fiber. We looked at the frequency of stimulation. Let's look at the length of a fiber now. Length of the fiber. There we go. So again, we're looking at this graphically, but you can also look at the bottom pictures that shows you a single sarcomere. Okay, but this will be the same as the sarcomeres all down the length of your muscle fiber. And so the length of your muscle fiber can um, vary the tension that gets produced inside of there. And again, it has to do with the cross bridging. This is called the length tension relationship. So basically, let me first show you before I zoom in on the graph. If we're talking about my biceps brachii up here and I have my arms stretched out, my muscle cells are stretched out. They're pulled long, okay? If I put a heavy weight at the end, right, I might even pull them so that the sarcomeres pull apart, okay? And so then I'm not having much or any cross-bridging between actin and myosin, and that's what you can see in the sarcomere that's all the way over to the left, okay? It's got the length labeled underneath it. You don't have to remember the length at all. Okay, if I bend my muscles a little bit, so I bent, so I've got it, it's not quite a 40 or 90 degree angle, right? I've got it bent a little bit. Um, what I'm doing is with my muscle fibers inside of there, they're actually already cross bridging a little bit. So I'm producing a little bit of overlap, okay? And so that's allowing, you can think of it as allowing myosin to get a grip on actin. Before, you can't get a grip. Now, you're getting a grip, okay? So normally, if I pick something up, I'm gonna bend my arm a little bit, right? You always bend your arm a little bit when you're gonna pick something up with that your estimate has any weight to it, okay? But if I have it too contracted like this, then you see the first panel there. Then my sarcomeres are already, that's maximal tension. So remember that the actin gets pulled toward the end line. Well, if you contract your cells too much before you try to pick something up, 
then you have too much overlap and your actin is hitting the M lines and you can't go past that. There, there's no room to go past it, okay? So when you pick up something heavy again, you don't, you don't bend your arm like this and you still, that would be hard to pick up. You can try these things at home. Find the optimal position to pick something up. Do it with a gallon of milk or if you've got an eight pound weight or something like that. Okay, so that's what I mean with length tension. The length of your muscle cells can generate a different amount of tension. And so um, the graph above shows the percentage of length at when your muscle is at rest. So even when I bend my arm, my arm's still at rest, but I've got some cross bridging occurring. Okay, and I've already started to develop some tension. Okay, so that middle length, there's an optimal length. Again, I, I don't care that you know these absolute numbers. That's not the point. Because it honestly it can be different in different people. Um, but there is an optimal length, and, and we translate that as to an optimal bend in the arm or bend in the legs if you're going to pick something up and you need to use your legs or whatever it is. There's an optimal length there because you're getting an optimal amount of actin and myosin um, cross bridging, okay? Um, so that yields a good amount of tension and that you can produce more tension. If there's no overlap, you can't produce any tension. If there's too much overlap, right, you can't produce any more tension. So you can't generate any tension to pick up, overcome the load of your object, okay? Um, so make, again, this is a very important concept. Make sure you can explain this length tension relationship. Always remember, it has to do with the cross bridging, the amount of cross bridging between actin and myosin. Okay, another example I give is if I throw you a rope and I say, if we're gonna have a tug of war and I only allow you to hold the very end, like two inches of the rope. And I say, if you beat me, I'm gonna give you an A in the class but I take the rope and I wrap it around my body. <laughs> you can't generate enough tension to pull, right? I can, because I got a lot of overlap. So that's kind of the, the idea that's going on here, okay? All right, after length tension relationship, we said we'd talk about the thickness of a fiber. So the thickness of the fiber has to do with your muscle fiber growth, okay? And we refer to that as hypertrophy. You might have learned about this in anatomy as well. All right, so here you can see a muscle in the first circle there. You see several fibers. And that's, um, the, you can see the normal muscle cells. Okay, the, the muscle cells are also known as myocytes. That's why that's written there. A site is a cell and myo refers to muscle. Okay, we can just call them muscle fibers or muscle cells. Okay, well, as you work out, you're working out here, um, you start to, to break little tiny breaks within those muscle cells during your strength training. And so that causes your muscle cells to repair. And when they repair, they add more mitochondria, they add more actin and myosin, they add more of the cellular machinery within the muscle cells and they get thicker. And so therefore, overall, your whole muscle gets thicker and you, you get a bigger muscle. Okay, that's hypertrophy. The opposite can happen. If you're not using your muscle enough, then the, the, you can, they'll, the muscle will start to um, disintegrate some of the extra machinery in there because it's not needed and it'll get real skinny. And so that's called atrophy. So if you have your arm in a cast for a while or something, when you get it out, you realize your forearm's really skinny compared to the other arm that didn't have a cast. But you can reverse that. You work it out and you can increase the size. Okay, if you're a bodybuilder, you do this to the max, right? And you really get bulky muscles. Okay, so muscle fiber growth, the thicker the fiber is, with the more machinery in it, the more tension it can develop. You've got more actin, more myosin, making more cross bridges. That's why bulkier people tend to be stronger. Okay. All right, the last one we we're going to talk about um, regarding affecting muscle tension is fatigue. Okay, muscle fatigue. So muscles require a lot of ATP to function. Okay, and we talked about ATP in different areas. Remember that myosin head has to split ATP um, to provide energy for the power stroke. 
Okay, there has to be a fresh molecule of ATP that binds to the myosin head in order for the cross bridge to be released once that ATP is expended in the power stroke. Okay, and then even um, to release um, and not bind again uh, to cover the, so the tropomyosin will cover the active sites, we have to get rid of the calcium. So there's calcium pumps on the SR that draws the calcium out of the cytoplasm. Okay, so ATP runs calcium pumps, so it actively gets pumped back up. So that's a lot of ATP that your muscle cells are using. Okay, so they just need a continuous supply of ATP, and there's actually not a lot of storage for ATP. We store, your muscles can store glucose in the form of glycogen. So you get a lot of glycogen in your muscle cells to make ATP. But once it's made, there's not a lot of uh, ways to store it. So we really have three pathways to, for the muscles to get a hold of ATP. And you learned two already. Glycolysis is one, okay? The first sta stage is cell respiration. And then oxidative phosphorylation is the second one, basically what's happening through the electron transport chain. Okay, and also through the Krebs and electron transport chain. We separate those two because if there's no oxygen, then oxidative phosphorylation doesn't work. But glycolysis can continue to run. But you know, you, I know you know, there's not a lot of ATP made in glycolysis. Okay, so let's look at a third way that our cells can, they're not generating ATP like glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation is. Um, but they're, they're just using energy from other molecules that are within the cell to help to um, um, kind of generate more ATP inside of there, okay? So this is what it looks like. We use a molecule called, called creatine phosphate or phosphocreatine. doesn't matter which way you say it. Okay, so creatine is a molecule that's found inside of our cells. And we can bind, so after we make ATP, that's why I say we're not making new ATP. So after um, cellular respiration occurs and we make ATP, creatine will come along, and this is usually during rest, when your skeletal muscle is at rest. It will come along and it will remove one of the uh, inorganic phosphates off of ATP and bind with it. So that's why it's called phosphocreatine. Okay, and then you have ADP floating around. But now you've got a really quick way to replace that inorganic phosphate to the ATP when your muscles demand it. Okay, and that's during exercise. Now all of a sudden you're using your muscles and you need ATP real quickly. And we saw that cellular respiration can take some time. Okay, glycolysis can be fast, but it doesn't produce a lot of ATP. So you've got your phosphocreatine already in your cells. It can quickly then release the inorganic phosphate. It'll bind back to the ADP, and you make ATP. Okay, and now you've got ATP available. So the reaction at the top, you see the two arrows. So with phosphocreatine, creatine phosphate, again, the phosphate will, cl will clip off, and that high energy phosphate will attach to the ADP. Then you see our arrow going to the right. So the products that you're left with are the creatine. And now that inorganic phosphate is attached to the molecule of ATP. That's what we wanted. Okay, and that again happens during exercise. But then you're at rest. So now there's ATP floating around. And so we can, we can store it on the creatine molecule. So that's the arrow that's going to the left. It just means this um, reaction runs backwards. The inorganic phosphate from ATP can be bound to the creatine, and what you're left with is creatine phosphate and ADP. So it's just a faster way. So again, cell respiration is actually creating the ATP because of using glucose and the steps we went through cell respiration. Um, but then in order to have all this ATP floating around when we don't need it, this is just a way for the muscle to, so that the, the inorganic phosphate, because they can, they, they're not stable, remember, so they can pop off. We don't want that to happen. We want to preserve that electron so the creatine grabs onto it. Okay. All right.
So a um, little more on fatigue. So what causes fatigue? Okay, there can be physiological causes, and then there's a type of fatigue, a cause referred to as central fatigue. Okay, so again, the exercising muscle just can't respond to stimulation with the same degree of the contractile activity it did before, right? So you still may be spit, um, stimulating it, but you're just not able to um, respond to that. And so this could be a defense mechanism against actually reaching a point of the inability to produce ATP. That would be pretty bad if we completely depleted our ATP stores and we're not able to produce anymore. That can have catastrophic events, through, uh, problems throughout the body, right? So the reality is that the underlying causes of muscle fatigue are unclear, but we believe, again, these two situations are happening. So one is physiological within the, the, between the neuron and the cells themselves. We'll talk about that. That's also called primary fatigue. Okay, and this has to do with an increase of when we're splitting the ATP and we get ADP and inorganic phosphate, those two molecules now that are building up might actually interfere with the cross bridging. So the more and more of that that builds up might actually just get in the way of the cross bridging. And, and also it can get in the way of the calcium release. You just have more molecules available because we're splitting the ATP and making two molecules now. Okay. Um, also, when we have to produce ATP aerobic, anaerobically, sorry, um, we end up producing lactate or lactic acid. And that accumulation could also affect um, the ability to, to create tension and we get fatigue. Um, with the, all of the electrical activity, uh, remember there's action potentials on the sarcolemma itself, the cell membrane. So just like a regular action potential we learned about, potassium leaves the cell. So the accumulation of potassium can start to build up, affecting the release of other ions and things. Okay, and you might just be using up, like I said, glucose is stored in glycogen. So you might be using up the glycogen. Central fatigue, so that, that's down at the muscle cell itself. Central fatigue goes on in your mind. Okay, the CNS is no longer adequately activating your motor neurons. Okay, the, the ones that are supplying these skeletal muscles. So we call this a psychologically based fatigue. The mechanisms here are poorly understood, but again, it could be the neuron itself with the sodium and potassium getting um, the concentration gradients reversing and the uh, sodium potassium pumps have to catch up. Okay, that might be it. But we see central fatigue, we can overcome central fatigue, right? And those of you who are in labs saw, are doing this with the lab, you saw this with my friend. You guys can do this. That's why sometimes you go to the gym with a friend. You say you get more motivated if you go. So if you're working out and you're like, oh, I'm getting tired, I don't wanna do this anymore. And then your friend comes by and goes, no, 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 come on, you can do it, you can do it. You start pumping harder. Oh, I thought you were tired, <laughs> right? That's central fatigue. This is why it's so hard for our athletes right now in COVID. They feed off of us, the crowds. They have to hear the cheering. Look at um, the fans at SDSU do a great job when our basketball players start to get tired and they're not performing as well. The fans really rally and they, I've been to a game, it's really incredible. And they really start to rally up and scream and yell in unison. And all of a sudden our basketball players really get into it and they get good, really good again and they win games, right? So that we can overcome central fatigue. And central fatigue might be a um, protection against the physiological fatigue. So it might make you start to think you're tired before physiologically you actually are. And that might be a way to slow things down a bit so that we can start to get ion concentrations in the right place and generate more ATP and then you can bring it up again. Alrighty, so know the difference between physiological fatigue and central fatigue. Almost done here. Because now that we know how our muscles contract, and how our individual muscle cells contract, and then how our um, muscle as a whole contracts, now we're gonna classify those contractions. We have two main types, 
Okay, one is called isotonic contraction, and the other is isometric contraction. Okay, so again, this has to do with tension and then whether or not the um, length of the muscle changes. Okay, so isotonic contraction, the one on the left, you can see here we have movement. So the biceps brachii is contracting, and because it's contracting, it's producing enough force to overcome the load, which is the barbell, the weight of the barbell, and it's moving the barbell. That's isotonic. Isotonic means there's movement. But now look at the other picture on the right. This one is the person is um, holding a rope and they're pulling upward, but they're not move the rope is anchored down and they can't move it. So the bicep is still contracted, the muscle is contracted, but there's no movement occurring. Okay, they're not overcoming a load. Okay, so it's contracted, but there's no movement. That's called an isometric contraction. Isometric contraction. Okay, so again, Isotonic, the muscle accomplishes work when the load is moved, okay? In isometric, the amount of, um, the contraction is occurring, right? The muscle is contracted, but the load isn't being moved, okay? So that's important to remember those two types, righty? But now I'm gonna go and um, talk about an isotonic contraction, there are two types of isotonic contractions. Okay. An isotonic contraction, again, where you're moving a load, when you're shortening the muscle through this contraction cycle, as you see on the left side with the barbell moving up, you're shortening the biceps brachii, it's contracting, and it's shortening, you get a concentric contraction. When you lower the barbell and you lower it slowly, we say you control it, okay? And you're lowering the barbell down, you don't wanna just drop it. Your muscle is still contracted because you're controlling it, but it's lengthening while you're doing that. That's called an eccentric contraction, okay? So an eccentric contraction, the contractile activity is resisting the stretch, okay? All righty. So again, in both cases, we're talking about what's happening with the biceps brachii. The triceps is doing something the opposite. Okay, so when you do a push-up, you've got all of these things occurring. You've got, in, in, when you're pushing up your biceps brachii, you're lengthening it. That's eccentric, an eccentric isotonic contraction. When you go back down, you're, you're shortening it, right? And that one is, uh, c c I'm sorry, yeah, concentric isotonic contraction. When I hold it, I'm not laying on the ground, I'm holding it either at the bottom or I'm holding it at the top, I'm not moving, but they're contracted. That's isometric. All righty. Um, couple more slides, my dog is whining outside the window, uh, outside the door, he misses me. Um, <laughs> so I'll let him in in a second, but a couple more things. Now this is related to um, when we vary the strength of a muscle contraction, we get what's called a load velocity relationship. So remember the load is the weight of the object you're trying to overcome. All load velocity relationship says that when the load is light, you can contract faster. When the load is heavy, your contractions are slower. That's all that this thing means, okay? There's a point though, when the force or the load is so heavy that the contraction becomes isometric. And you've done that when you can't pick something up, you just have an isometric contraction. You can't overcome the load. Alrighty. The last thing is that we have different types of muscle fibers. Not all muscle fibers do the same thing, okay? Um, we have three different types, and the main difference between these three fiber types is their speed of contraction and the type of enzymes that they primarily use to bake ATP, right? So if it says oxidative, oh, and I just saw a typo on that middle one. 
OXY, it should be OXI, oxidative. Um, and I, oxidative fiber means that it's using oxygen to make ATP. Okay, so the energy storages aren't as uh, depleted as quickly, and you don't get as much lactic acid accumulation. So they're more resistant to fatigue. So they do tend to have more mitochondria because they're making more ATP. They have more capillaries. Um, they have a lot of myoglobin. This is the pigment that can store oxygen. It's similar to hemoglobin, but myoglobin is found in our muscle cells. Okay, so oxidative uses oxygen. Okay. But then if it's a fast fiber or slow fiber, right, this, this says how quickly the cross bridging can occur. Okay. And that has to do with the ATP enzyme on the myosin head, how quickly it can actually hydrolyze that ATP to get the cross bridging to occur more quickly. Okay. So in the first uh, little boy that's running there, he's showing off his slow oxidative fibers. These are more for long distance. That means they don't contract very quickly at all, um, and, but they um, use oxygen to make, so it can make a lot of ATP. So you can sustain activity with slow oxidative fibers for a much longer time, okay? The middle one, fast twitch oxidative. This means, again, it's using um, oxygen. It can use glycolysis, however, both. It actually has a mixture of both. So it doesn't have quite as many mitochondria as a slow oxidative do, but it still has a lot. But they can make faster uh, cross bridging, so they twitch faster. Okay, and so this might be more. Um, wish I, I should let my dog in, like a dog's tail. They wag it back and forth. It goes pretty quickly. It's twitching back and forth pretty quickly, but they can sustain that for a long time. Especially if you got a very happy dog. Okay, so it, it's, it's um, again, it's, it's the movement is more, is faster and they can handle, do it for a long time or rattlesnake. Okay, so the contractions are coming faster, right? Um, and they can sustain it for a long time. The last one, fast twitch glycolytic, so it's primarily using glycolysis, so it doesn't use oxygen. Um, and the fibers twitch, they contract very quickly but um, you can't sustain it for a long time. So like that little boy there is a sprinter, okay? And the sprinters have a lot of fast glycolytic um, cells in their legs, and so they can run really fast for a short period of time. They can't keep it up, okay? So you actually have, all of us actually have all three muscle fiber types, but genetically you might have one type more than the other type. So like I'm a cyclist, and I need at least 10 miles to warm up. And then a short ride for me is 40 miles. And then when I wanna do a nice long ride, I get 100 miles in, okay? That's why I have a more slow twitch muscle fibers, okay? I used to swim in um, high school and college. I was a long distance swimmer because I can keep my muscles going forever. I can go forever. Sprints, I'm terrible. You want to sprint me on a bike or this pool, you'll probably win. I can't turn my arms over so fast when I swim. I can't spin my legs over so fast. So I don't have, as, as somebody else who's a good sprinter, I don't have as many fast twitch glycolytic cells or type 2B. Okay. Somebody, um, I probably have a good amount of type 2A, the fast twitch oxidative, because I also did the middle distance swimming. I was also very good at that. So, and then you can build up those different fiber types to an extent. So with training, you can train a little bit to build up those fiber types, but you're not gonna really switch over. So when you watch the Olympics and you see the people who are the sprinters compared to the people who are the marathoners, you don't really see marathoners ever sprinting and vice versa. Because just genetically, if you're at that high caliber, you know, you cannot train, that marathoner will never train to be as fast as an Olympic sprinter. Okay, that is just doesn't, just genetically it doesn't work that way. Marathoner though might be able to train and be a good middle distance runner and vice versa. The, the sprinter could probably do some middle distance too. Um, so there's a little bit of training that can, you can, you can train uh, um, your muscle fibers. Uh, I would do that on my trainer, my bike, spin my legs really fast for a long time. 
um, as fast as I could. And I and I built that up. I got better, but I'm still never going to be a sprinter. Okay. So make sure you know those three types. Um, the, and the, what, what makes them those three types? What are these characteristics? So I listed a lot of them. You've got a great table in your book that shows the difference between those three types. And then how they manifest themselves. You know, uh, just this idea, give an example that slow twitch fibers are for more long distance sustained contractions. Okay, that's it. Let's see if my dog's there. Agnes! I guess he gave up on me. Um, <laughs> that's it. So uh, there's one more lecture in this series, and that's going to be primarily on smooth muscle and a little bit on cardiac muscle. Um, hope you guys are having a good day. Bye-bye.